Hello everyone, welcome to the start of a new Let's Play series on the channel. We're going to be attempting Amazon, which is a first person point and click adventure game from 1999. So, funny story, I had to pause uh, before I started recording here. Uh, first of all, because a, uh, a car alarm was going off outside for quite a while, um, but then once that had stopped, a, a horse and cart went down the road, um, which is an unusual sight around here. So I did. Um, I just had to stop to to watch that pass. Um, but second part of the funny story is that I have already um, attempted to play, start playing, and record this series before. Um, I was in the mood for a nice, uh, a calm, relaxing, mildly head scratching adventure game, um, and Amazon stood out to me as one that I'd like to try. I'd purchased it on GOG. And I, first of all, I attempted to play the Mac version available there, which I do not recommend to anybody. So it's, um, it seems to have been entirely reconstructed uh, from the original materials um, to, to work on Mac. And it seems to be missing key uh, cutscenes. Um, and cutscenes are very important to the, the narrative um, of this game. So that just sort of fell apart. And besides that, none of the controls work as described in the manual. They, they were all altered as well. But this, as far as I can tell, this Windows version that we're looking at now, um, works exactly as the uh, the manual originally described, and um, yeah, it's it's just a, a a modern modern playable version of that original release from 1999. Uh, so I'll go into a little bit more background on the game. We're going to uh, options here. So unfortunately, cutscenes and occasional dialogue are important to the game, but unfortunately there's no option for subtitles on that dialogue, uh, I'm afraid. Um, we just get a couple of, uh, well, sliders, kind of, um, these kind of wooden <laughs> wooden representations of, uh, of um, levels. So for rotation, I guess it would be the strength of rotation, because you look around by moving the mouse, um, and volume. Um, so uh, sound music will all be the same thing. It's mostly going to be sound effects from what I've seen so far. But I'm going to get the credits playing underneath, so we'll we'll get some of the rare um, and exciting music and get to see the full credits at length. I don't I haven't found any way that I can skip this. Um, and uh, and yeah, we'll also get to see some of the uh, really incredible creature designs that uh, form uh, part of the game. So enjoy those, and I'm going to go into a few more details about the uh, background of the game. Here we go. So yeah, so it's a game published by uh, Microids. I guess if we're trying a French pronunciation, it's uh, Microids? Microids. 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 Um, uh, <laughs> primary designer is Benoit Socal. So uh, Benoit Socal is uh, best known, I think, uh, in adventure game circles as the creator of the Siberia series of adventure games, which I have not yet played, but um, in my mind take up that same kind of place as something like the uh, the Longest Journey, sort of the late 90s, early 2000s uh, European adventure game movement that um, put heavy emphasis on the narrative and a kind of a, a mature uh, narrative as well. So after the, um, so I associate kind of the the golden age of the um, the American adventure game, the uh, the funny in inverted commas uh, adventure game of Sierra and LucasArts, ending kind of with Grim Fandango in 1998, I believe, um, and then this sort of second period of uh, predominantly European adventure games uh, begins. Uh, so I kind of put it in there with those, uh, and as I understand it, Amazon is. Um, not just the predecessor to Siberia for uh, Benoit Socal, but also um, it's supposed to inhabit the same fictional world, kind of an alternative history version of our world, um, which looks a bit steampunky, but is actually set in uh, the in contemporary society. So uh, I think 1998 for this game is the year it's supposed to be set in. So yeah, the game was published by um, Mike Rhodes and also Casterman, who, who I know predominantly as a um, publisher of Bon Dessinée, um, uh, French-Belgian comic strips. So um, Benoit Socal probably had a, a much longer 
and possibly more influential career as a um, as a comics creator um, and created a long running series of albums uh, based on the character Inspector Canade, who is um, an anthropomorphic duck detective. And apparently one of those albums covers uh, basically this story. So somehow uh, the anthropomorphic duck character gets involved in something similar to this with these um these invented animal creatures in this uh fictional south american country i don't i don't quite know how that all comes to be or how that works out when there are no humans present but apparently that's the case so yeah so the, uh, sadly um suddenly benoit Sokal um died last year in 2021 before the release of, I believe, the fourth Siberia game. Um, and yeah, so if if this goes well, and we, we have enough time later on, uh, so the Siberia games are ones I would like to tackle as well. I, I don't want to let it go without saying that um, uh, I did find the manual for this game very underwhelming. There's a, there's a PDF included in the, um, in the GOG package, um, and it's a scan of the um, well, what basically was would have been the insert in the CD case, and it's just one piece of paper, it's a folded piece of paper, and uh, two of the sides have some instructions on. They're extremely bare bones um, and don't quite make sense in English. I, there are some translation issues in the game, I think, and we'll we'll find quite a few typos if uh, the documents in this Windows version are the same as the Mac one, and I I believe they would be. Um, but apparently I'm mainly going to be using the left and right mouse buttons. I can't, apparently I can use the escape uh, key for the main menu, which makes sense. But also the tilde symbol for stopping the animations, which I think means skipping cutscenes, as far as I can tell. Um, and then there'll be a whole range of stuff to go in with the inventory. One thing I do like, and I do kind of like, it's weird, but I like it. Uh, and makes more sense here than it did in the Mac version that I was looking at is that um, the kind of each even parts of the menu are kind of a a landscape an environment so in the options so I can adjust these these are sort of uh, in the themed with a um, with kind of a low technology setting where we're just sort of putting bars on a on a um, a, a slat or something, uh, but you can kind of go out. The way to get out of this menu is to go out of the scene through through sort of this um, aperture into the wilderness beyond. Um, and then, if you are saving your game, so oh, I can't save it. If you are loading your game, sorry. So you get this like hall of panels. So these will be filled up with save games eventually. So not many. I don't know if it's a is it a hexagonal room? It looks like it might be a hexagonal one. So six save game slots. But to get out, you just have to um, tilt up to the ceiling, and then that's just kind of your view vanishes out, which I th is weird and in its own way awkward, but also somehow elegant. All right, that's enough of me wittering on. Let's start this new game. We're gonna get a cutscene straight off, so I will be quiet for the, the dialogue. So You are the journalist, aren't you? Are you talking to me? I gave him your letter the other day. He's probably read it. I he received so. another letter this morning. I put it in his mailbox. It was a letter from the museum. Ah, uh, letters from the museum. They always mean trouble. Maybe you could take it to him. He has trouble moving around, you know. He's an old man. Well, you see what I mean. If you want my advice, you should see a doctor. Well, that's what I think. Great, thanks. I mean, d did you not want to help him to get the letter? Is that your your job? It's a nice little environment of detail of the birds up there. 
So yeah, so we get kind of a, um, it's a 2D, it's a pre-rendered image, um, but we can kind of look around it in all directions and find some hot spots to interact with, so the curse will change when we can do something. We can't move back down the road uh, whence we came, we can move forward along it. I believe we got a little glimpse of the lighthouse that's our destination before. There you go, that's the lighthouse up there. So the um, yeah the curse will change to various different symbols when we can do things. When it's the um, arrow, sort of the compass, compass rose kind of view, that's um, it's just free sort of free roaming around. So we can go backwards and forwards in this case. And then uh, here I know there is a uh, viewing platform. So let's go and have a look through this little telescope here. So it's doing this movement and zoom in all by itself. I can um, I can then look around. So there are some uh, some birds heading off there. I can move around the view now under my own control. And I think the um, that's an exit symbol, the uh, the rectangle with an arrow pointing to one side. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think I can just exit the view. So I think that's just a bit of scene setting, as far as I can tell. Oh yeah, and if you notice, the hand is interact with something. Um, it works. Um, nice nicely I think um, it's, it's still a weird interface it's kind of it's, this is very much in the era of, um, of FMB first person adventure games so I think of although I've never played it I've got a conception of what Myst is maybe maybe Myst is another one we can do on the channel at some point but yeah all those FMB games that are kind of first person um, and operate something like this where you just sort of bobble around uh, looking for hot spots and um, solving some obtuse, <laughs> obtuse puddles in between highly compressed video clips. Uh, that kind of game. Okay, so I, d I do know what we're going to have to do here, but I'm also going to have to get used to how uh, how this interface works because it's slightly different. So I just snatched that letter that the postman told us about, and this nicely uh, turns into a, a door handle. So that. That fits quite naturally, so we can open that up and oh, we immediately go through. So here we are at the lighthouse. Okay, I'm going to see if I can get our inventory to work. So I need to right click for that apparently. Oh, here we go. Brilliant. Um, and then I should be able to have a look at this letter. Okay, let's read this. So uh, this is bad. We are reading somebody else's post. This is probably illegal. Uh, so this is from the Museum d'Histoire Naturelle, Jardin des Plantes, Paris, uh, to Michel Valenbois. So this is presumably who's living in this lighthouse. Uh, yes, because we're at the Fair des Rochers Noirs, Presqu'île de Longuevin, France. Sir, we have thoroughly examined your plans for a new expedition to the Amazon, and regret to inform you that we are unable to follow up your request for a grant. First, the present economic situation does not permit us to finance such a risky exploration. Second, my colleagues and I are of the opinion that, unfortunately, you still have not abandoned that empirical fallacy which formerly was at the root of the dispute between you and the museum. This venerable institution, which I now have the honour of representing, still recalls that bitter disappointment and mockery in the scientific world in consequence to the findings of your first expedition in 1936 which, at the outset, we were weak enough to support. Like my honourable predecessors did back then, I would like to warn you against the dangers of an undertaking in which adventurous fantasies supplant strict scientific rigour. Edouard Moulot, curator. Okay, so it looks like we have a disgraced scientist. Um, who had, yes, who purported to make discoveries in uh, the, uh, the country of Amazon. Um, we can wander over here. Um, get some different angles on this building. Enjoy all the all the foley that's going on. It's quite an aggressive, uh, aggressively noisy sea, but then sometimes the sea is. So there's some uh, there's some kind of structure at the back here. It looks like um, room for an elevator by the looks of it. So I wonder if um, because this is a uh, as a Franco-Belgian game originally. I wonder if uh, the Am calling a country the Amazon sounds less naff if you're uh, if you're not a native English speaker. I suspect it probably does. Oh 
Oh, that's nice. I so I think the the graphics were redone somewhat as well for the Mac version because I don't remember having the the birds flying around. Everything was a a lot more static in that way. That's a hell of an anchor. All right, let's go in to this. Uh, oh, to this lighthouse. Hello, uh, Monsieur Valenbois. Okay, a bit creepy. Um, okay, we can get a hammer. So if I go, ah, okay, so we've got. Interesting. In the um. So I think. Yeah. So I think. Oh, wait, so we pick it up, and our icon changes to that, and then we go out there, and then we've got that selected. I think. I think that's how this is supposed to work. Yeah, it looks like it. I'm gonna put it down now. Um, in the Mac version, you have different inventories for letters and for items. So I think we can we can interfere with that. Oh, hello. But I didn't quite want to go down to the basement just yet. I just wanted to make sure the way was open. Let's go see Monsieur Van Ambois. Hello? Oh. Oh, I was just staring at the darkness. I thought it hadn't loaded. Okay. Some of the angles are a bit a bit weird, so we're now sort of glancing down at the entryway there that we've just been in a moment ago. But we need to head up these stairs. And then, oh yes, this is, so this is the room. Okay, so I think all we can do initially is just head over to Monsieur, Monsieur Valenbois, a uh, scientist. So the, <laughs> the, um, the icon of the listening horn, uh, I think that's what that is, is that you can, you can listen to something or, or someone. So yeah, let's talk to, well, listen to Monsieur Valenbois. You are the journalist, aren't you? Amazon? 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 Too late for me? <coughs> Too late. It's all over for me. I am no longer in good health, my friend. It's a pity, but what can I do? <coughs> in any case, Amazon, all that. No one ever believed me, so... <coughs> After all those years, it's incredible. The egg. The egg. The egg. It's still alive. Alive. Yes. I had planned to take it back over there to Amazon. My expedition was ready. I had it all planned out down to the smallest detail. But now, it's all over. I have no strength left. <coughs> I have no strength left. You must go for me. You must go. Take the egg back. Take the egg of the white birds back to Amazon. I beg you, please. <coughs> so, unfortunately, I think that's where our, our scientist dies. Um, the music seems to have stopped itself. Uh, which is appropriate enough, I suppose. Um, yeah, so that's that's the end of Monsieur Valenbois. Um, full props to the um, the voice cast so far. They've done a sterling job um, as as a dub artists of of rapid firely uh, fitting their um, their performances into the uh, the animation of, uh, of the original language uh, recording. So we can have a look more at this picture here. Okay, so it's uh, a word that I can't quite read in the year of 1933. Um, so it's clearly a, a cherished uh, a cherished photo of some kind. And then we can look in a drawer, I think. And we've just nabbed something. Um, yeah, so I mean, so if if we were role playing this at all, um, I think we'd immediately uh, phone for an ambulance, and uh, and we would eventually tell our uh, our publication, whoever we work for, that um, what well, the story is that this the scientist has died, um, 
before achieving what they had hoped to. Oh, interesting. Oh, there's an actual puzzle here. So this was entirely skipped in the version I'd played before because I picked the phone up and it just automatically, uh, it automatically um, rang someone. Also, I got a couple of things out of this. Uh... Okay, so this is a uh, a fairly lengthy handwritten letter. Which oh, how do I get out of a letter like that? Um, and this is a typewritten one. So I could, hang on, I can phone the museum, can't I? But I'll need to write down this telephone number. Okay, I'll write this telephone number down and we'll phone the uh, museum, although... I don't know, what's the... Um, should we try... I don't know what the, uh, the French emergency phone number is. Uh, let's try 911. No, let's try 999. No. Okay. Um, Alright, so let's try 0, 3, 4, 6, 5, 2, 8, 1, 7, but, uh, 9. Good? No. Okay. We'll start, we'll start from scratch without me messing around first. Uh, zero, three, four, six, five, two, eight, one, seven, nine. Hello, Museum of Natural History, Paris, France. Office of the Curator, Edward Milo speaking. What? Valenpois. You again. I, I swear, I told you before, nice. it's no use phoning. Your expedition plans to the Amazon do not interest us. Do you understand? But, but, but we, have, we have neither the desire nor the means to back your fraudulent adventures. So I, 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 I beg you to stop bothering us. My predecessors learned the hard way the cost of trusting you. And but, but, but I, I won't be taken in. Do you hear me? I, 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 I am a serious scientist, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye and good riddance. Well, that was quite the performance, wasn't it? Uh, so uh, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't Mr. Van and Bar. Mr. Van and Bar has passed. It's me, it's my consequences, the journalist. I can come back to the phone, though, if I have another number to call, so that's interesting. Right, I think we can go up here. The um, environmental design is very detailed and um, there's been quite a lot of attention paid to environmental storytelling, I think. Um, so I really appreciate that. I think there's kind of, I really like, um, it's probably just a nostalgia on my part, but I do really like the, the grungy CGI of, of the late 90s, early noughties. Um, it's got a really nice textural quality to it. Um, Okay, so there's things we can look at on the desk. We've got um, a transfixed uh, insect specimen, the Carfardus horribilis. Um, I don't think there's anything we can do there. I think there's stuff we can pick up, like uh, this album. And then there's a book we can look at, which has Le Ocul Femel, Le Ocul Mal. Um, I don't know if they're relevant, really. I think that's I think that's what we can get there. We can look at the globe. Oh, fun! We can look at the projector. I think. Yeah, let's go. So, uh, turn it on. Put the slides in. There we go. I think that's the same person we saw in the photo downstairs, by the looks of it. I think that's... Okay, let's just go backwards and forwards from that point. And turn it off. Yeah. 
So I think all this is mostly here for, for storytelling purposes. And uh, there's some interesting creatures on the wall over here. I don't know if we get to see those. Any oh, yep, we certainly do. So some more of the, uh, the interesting uh, creature designs there. Um, all right, let's head up this ladder because I think there's something up here we need to find as well amongst the jars and books and uh, little crocodile specimens uh, on this desk here. I think there's something to grab here. Anything else here? No. Interesting. Okay, well, let's have a look. So that would be, so we've picked up, uh, I'll, I'll run, us through it, run us through it briefly here, um, a really lovely album of uh, notes and art from uh, Van Ambois journey, original journey to the Amazon, which will, um, I think is going to contain quite a few clues for our adventure to come. Um, and lots of, lots of really cool design work. It is quite long. <laughs> so, um, I'll guess to the end of this. I think you can, can you get, oh, you can't get out at any point. Um, by going to the the bottom left, you have to make it all the way through the the book. There we go, and those must have been the white birds of legend. Or maybe you could. Okay. Anyway, but there is a letter for us. I think yes, this is a letter for us, um, which I will read to finish off our episode today. Okay, here we go. So this will put uh, what we have just experienced in some context. My dear friend, I am an old man in the twilight of his years. I know now that I will never have the strength to set off again to the Amazon. My only remaining hope resides in convincing you to go in my stead, to make amends for the wrong I have done to that country over 50 years ago. It was in 1929 at the university where I was finishing my studies in natural sciences that I first heard of the Amazon. I befriended a young law student from that country. His name was Antonio Alvarez, and he was later to become the despotic leader that we know today. But at that time, he was just a young law student, full of ideals. He spoke with such communicative fervour about his wild and unknown country that soon I had just one idea on my mind, to set off for the Amazon to explore those vast, intact regions and meet those strange Indians and discover the incredible exotic plants and animals. In the spring of 1932, those gentlemen from the museum officially sent me on a discovery expedition to the Amazon to make an initial dis inventory of its fauna and flora. Despite my young age and inexperience, I gained their confidence and some funds, for until that day no renowned explorer had ever been that brave or thoughtless to venture into those vast, unviolated regions. Antonio Alvarez suggested going with me as my guide and interpreter, until we got to the last steps of civilization in his country. I accepted his offer with an open heart. A second companion was to join me, the Reverend Father David Makovsky, a young missionary from La Compagnie de Jesus, who shared my fascination for the Amazon and was burning with desire to evangelize the inhabitants of those regions forgotten by the Creator. We set off, therefore, one morning in June 1932, on board the Hydrofloat, a revolutionary invention of mine which, according to my plans, was designed to meet all the needs of a modern scientific exploration. I had spent a good part of the museum funds as well as the meagre family inheritance to build it. Unfortunately, this first prototype had several imperfections. The mechanics failed us on the way and it was only by a miracle that we set foot on the shores of the Amazon. For some weeks, all three of us travelled to Puebla, a fort village upstream the delta on the river Amazon. It was there, in the mouth of an old, drunken and erudite Indian, that I first heard of the great white birds. I was greatly fascinated by what he told me, and the following day, ignoring the warnings of my companions, and driven by the demons of proud scientific discovery, I set off towards the unknown, with the old Indian as my guide. They were a proud people, deprived of that fearful deference that the explorer usually finds in those primitive people who have never seen a white man. I remained bedridden for a few days, and a young Indian girl patiently lavished on me the care that was necessary for my recovery. 
Three times a day, a supple silhouette would stand out against the light of my do hut door. She would kneel down beside my mat, gently raise my head to give me strange medicine to drink. She would then pierce my feverish eyes with her big dark look, and then suddenly laugh like a child, her long brown hair sweeping my face like the caress of a light wind. My strength returned rapidly, but my nurse did not give up the care that she had grown accustomed to lavish on me. To tell the truth, we never left each other after that. Her name was Yakubani. I loved her and she loved me, and the mo months that followed were the most beautiful of my long life. We spent long hours bathing and fishing under the river falls, and when the heat of the day was at its height, we would slide into the intimate thick foliage of the river bank, away from the mocking glances of the rest of the tribe that gave favourable consideration to our relationship. I'm not quite sure that makes sense. The museum, my work, all that was quite far all that was quite far from my mind, I admit, and, in the arms of Yekumani, the only existence I could imagine from then on was the simple and natural life of the Indians of the Amazon. Yet a strange event would put an end to the sweet bliss in which we were plunged. One morning, while we were still sleeping, a young Indian boy that I did not know arrived in the village. He was welcomed with cries of joy and great display of affection. Yakumani signed me to get up and to watch what was happening through the branch walls of our hut. The young boy, I recall, had a very serious look on his face. He was carrying a big canvas bag fastened to his shoulder with leather straps. Walled in by a sort of hedge of honour formed by the entire tribe, he solemnly made his way towards the village priest and lay his heavy load at the latter's feet. The venerable old man untied the straps and removed an enormous egg. The entire village was overcome by a deafening silence that was hardly broken by the chirping of birds. Without saying a word, the priest introduced into the top part of the egg a long hollow stem that ended with a funnel-like shape. With this device, he inserted a mysterious liquid inside the egg, and after a while he withdrew the stem. White wisps of smoke were now coming out of the opening in the shell. The old man then proceeded to close the gap with a kind of white clay, then placing one hand on the side of the egg and raising the other towards the sky, he addressed the young boy with the following words, Volaho, ovo, ovo, volaho. The egg was then placed inside the canvas bag, and after having had some rest and something to eat, the Indian boy and his mysterious load set off again towards the marshlands that stretch upstream the falls. Yeah. I was tremendously intrigued, you may well imagine, by the ceremony that had taken place right under my eyes, and I questioned my young companion, without respite, about the meaning of all this. At first, she was very reluctant to answer my questions, but she eventually, no doubt weary of my assistance, she pointed to the totem sitting imposingly over the village. At the end of the mast, there were some big wooden birds with open wings that seemed to glide over the village. Ovo, Volaho, Ovo, she simply said, the white birds. The fever of my illness, compounded to that of love, had eclipsed my faculties of scientific observation. Love will tend to do that to you, as well a fever. But then and there, I suddenly came to myself. These Indians were the descendants of the legendary Ovovolaho tribe, and that what I had just seen in the hands of the priest was the egg of the white birds! Trickle, triple exclamation mark. I was like a madman. I gathered all my luggage and waited until night to sneak away from my hosts. I wanted the egg, the proof that the white birds really do exist. I wanted that egg more than anything else in the world. To take it back to Europe, to see it exhibited in the main hall of the museum, to obtain a chair at the university, all the demons of ambition had irre irremediably besieged my mind once more. Naturally, leaving Yekumani behind broke my heart. When we bid farewell, by the look on her face, I sensed how greatly confused she was. For a young Indian boy, going off in search of the egg of the white birds was a sort of perilous rite of initiation, which, if he passed, would enable him to enter into adulthood, and if the case arises, marry the one he loves. Yakumani thought that it was for her that I was about to undertake the perilous journey towards the sanctuary of the white birds, and that I would bring back the sacred egg for her. We loved each other all night, and at dawn I set off, never to see her again. It would take me too long to tell you about the long journey towards the white birds. 
Suffice it to say that the adventurer who attempts it should have remarkable physical and moral courage, and that, should you lack moral strength, you still have time to backtrack and try, if possible, to forget about the Amazon. But believe me, my friend, up there, among the clouds, on top of the sacred volcanoes of the Amazon, in the burning fumes of the craters, glide continually the most majestic and noble of all living beings that I have ever known in my long life. And I, Alexandre Valembois, I have committed an abominable act of treachery. I stole their only egg and took it back to Europe, only to appease a despicable personal ambition. I have put in danger the very existence of a truly exceptional living species, and I betrayed the trust of a young Indian girl who, I now know, was the only love of my life. I returned to Paris in the autumn of 1934. At the museum, no one believed my stories about the white birds. They declared that the egg I took back was, without a doubt, a big ostrich egg, and that I was only a fake, unworthy of their trust. I became the laughing stock of the scientific community, and my career was irreparably broken. After the war, I obtained with great difficulty the post of a natural history teacher in a modest high school. People no longer talked about the Amazon, which, under the dictatorship of Antonio Alvarez, my friend who had changed a great deal, has isolated itself from the rest of the world. Even I myself tried to forget about that country forever, but I could not. The white birds continued to soar over my head, and Yakumani's laughter still resounds in the course of my dreams. It has been ten years now since the museum has sorted out its dusty collection, and on that occasion sent me the egg of the white birds. It miraculously remained intact, not having suffered from the ravages of time. Driven by an ex inexplicable impulsion, I sounded it with a stethoscope, or almost fell over backwards, and almost fell over backwards, slow continuous heartbeats. The egg was alive. Since that day, I have had only one thing on my mind. Make right the wrong I have done, and take the egg back over there, to the Amazon, to the summit of the volcano, where it should have never left. In the meantime, I have put it in a safe place where it will have fresh constant temperature that is propitious to its lethargy. Today everything is in place. I have developed a new hydrofloat that is specially designed for an expedition into the heart of the Amazon. I have carried out all the necessary checks and calculations and have corrected all the imperfections. But as I have already told you, I am now an old man, and I no longer have the strength to undertake such a journey. So it is up to you, you who seem to be interested in this country, it is you that I am asking to take my place. Go to the Amazon and take back the egg, I beg you. Good luck, and may God protect you, my friend. Alexandre Valenbois. There we are, so that's, that's what's going on. Broadly speaking. And um, if it's uh, propitious to my lethargy, we'll be back again next time for uh, another episode and to explore a bit more. Obviously, um, in that letter there were there were some problematic uh, expressions. Um, there was definitely some uh, exoticization going on there. It's definitely um, written from the perspective of a, of a character with a, a colonial viewpoint. Um, so that's something to, to bear in mind. I don't think the, um, the game itself is going to be too aware of of those issues, um, but I guess we'll see when we get to the Amazon. We'll see how it deals with things there. So until next time, everybody, take care. See you soon. Bye bye.